So tēnā koutou katoa, uh, nā mai hari mai ki Our Farm. So hello everyone and welcome to Our Farm. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jo Sheridan and I am the demonstration manager here at Our Farm. <coughs> it's great to be able to have you all here today <coughs> in a fairly um, kind of carefree manner in, in some ways. Um, but just a couple of things to make sure you do stay safe while you enjoy your time here. Uh, we have got, um, there are face masks and hand sanitizer at the front counter there for you to use. Um, toilets around the back on the PK apron there. Um, and we will be heading out at about 12 o'clock out to see the heifers, so it will be pretty hot. So there's some sunscreen up the front counter there by Kate. Um, and feel free to grab a hat. And I think there's some water, Kate, has the water turned up? There's some water bottles at the bottom, so make sure that you do stay um, hydrated. Anyway, so um, as well as keeping you all safe, we want to make sure that you get value out of today. Um, for those of you who, oh, who's, who's here for the first time to our farm? Great. Oh, well, a special, super warm welcome to you all. It's lovely to see some new faces here. For those of you who haven't been here before, our farm is roughly about a 144-hectare dairy farm. It is a joint venture between Lincoln University and St Peter's School here in Cambridge. Um, our view really is demonstrating excellence in, in farm performance to create a sustainable future. So uh, we use the wagon wheel concept, which you'll see out on the board in the roundabout there, to help ensure that we're creating a balanced approach to how we move forward in that space. We're really grateful to have our team of partners with us here today, from um, Balance, DRNZ, uh, Fonterra Farm Source, PGG Rights and Seeds and Westpac. And just probably a bit of a shout out to some special members of our team that are here today who are part of our Farm Management Committee. And I'll just quickly scan the room to make sure I capture you all. Uh, Joe Faber from Westpac. Um, we've got uh, Rachel Foy, who's one of our Associate Farmer members on the committee. Uh, we've also got Ian Brown, who is our um, Chairman of our Farm Management Committee. Committee, um, Tom Buckley, who's our farm manager, big wave out there Tom, Sarah Wood at the back, who's with Fonterra Farm, Fonterra in the Waikato region, uh, Daniel Bradbury, who is um, a farmer out near between Cambridge and Te Aumutu there, associate member, and we've also got Richard Luxton, farmer member of our farm management committee. Frank, where are you? Oh, Frank Porter guys from Dairy and Z. Have I missed anyone? So these people are all part of our team, so um, whatever things we can't help out when you ask us questions, I'm sure that they can jump up and uh, deal with those for us. Um, I guess I just wanted to firstly maybe start the day by acknowledging the dry autumn conditions that we're in right at the, at the moment. Um, we've had 17 mils of rain in April. I think it's been the third driest on record for Hamilton Airport. At the moment, we're currently sitting out about, about a 30 millimetre soil moisture deficit at the moment. Uh, the last four weeks now, Tom, or maybe five, we've been growing in the low 20s um, from a pasture growth rate. We traditionally would be moving up to that 35 plus. This time last year, we were up around 60, <laughs> 60 growth rate and we had a cover of about 2,400 and we were absolutely grateful we still had some cows and milk. So, man, what a difference the seasons are making to us. Um, while we won't be spending a lot of time talking about the current seasonal situation, I just wanted to make sure that you took the time today to talk to those around you. There's lots of experienced farmers here and knowledgeable RPs that can help you um, work through some of the challenges that you've got, uh, put a plan in place and make sure that you've got the confidence and the skills to implement that plan. So um, you can always feel free to join Tom and I on our farm walks on Tuesdays. Um, we have a bit of a strategy every, every seven days. We do our farm walk, we put a plan in place and we stick to that plan to the next seven days. It takes the pressure off the stress you're feeling every day in between, but it means you've got a data point where you collect more data, you make a new decision based on the information that you've got and then you en en enact that strategy again. So uh, feel free to come and join us on one of those Tuesday farm walks uh, about 10 o'clock. Um, let us know if you're coming. Sometimes we try and beat the heat and get out as early as we can. So while we're dealing with some seasonal challenges right now... Oops! <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll just get... Thanks, Richard. Um, we need to make sure that the future of our business is in really good health, and we also need to make sure that we're taking really good care of our... Um, of our future herd. And that's what today's focus really is about. So we've got um, a session here where we're going to talk a little bit about business health and we're really lucky to have some experts from Westpac today just to talk about all those nasty C words, so COVID, conflict, capital, carbon, 
Um, and we're going to share a little bit about our financial budget and the opportunities that are available now with the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative and what that means for our farm. And then at about 12 o'clock, we're going to talk about and go out and talk about some mossies, some calves uh, on chicory. Um, and we're also going to talk about our sort of replacement strategy with what we've been doing at our farm. And we should be back here at about 12.40 where we'll do a bit of a summary, um, a bit of a farewell to, to Tom. This is going to be his last focus day after six and a half years with our farm. So um, we'll get a chance to sort of recognise that as well before we finish up. Okay, so just to give a little bit of context, um, back in March, I guess we sit down and we do our farm budget. Tom and I and um, Joe from Westpac sit down as a group and do, we do a zero budget up approach where we look at what does our farm system look like using Farmex uh, and what, do, what will it cost us to achieve the outcomes that we need. Uh, our socks were sort of blown off a little bit this year when we went through that process and it was really frightening. And probably not just for us, but for everybody else who's been going through that process over the last couple of months. And it really made us think about uh, what we need to know and understand uh, in order to make sure we are able to manage those risks in our farm business, not just for this year, but for all the years as we move forward. Now, just a bit of an overview about what a healthy farm business looks for us. We have what we call primary KPIs and we've got secondary KPIs. Our primary KPIs for us include farm working expenses, which we previously had a target of, of $4. That's been increased to $4.60. As soon as we got approval to increase it, we've really struggled to come anywhere near that. Um, we have operating profit per hectare, in which we aim to be in the top 20% in comparison with our peers in the Waikato district, so Waikato farmer own operators. Um, we like to compare and keep with them. And we also look at return on asset. We have two secondary KPIs, which are having our break-even milk price and also an opening debt figure. So that's kind of the things that we're measuring each year to see whether we're on track or not. So one of the things that we thought would be really helpful, because it's, well, you're all out there putting together your farm budgets, can I, can I just ask who's put their, together their farm budget for their 22-23 season already? Cool. And what are, what are, share with me a couple of big things that you've noticed with it. Renus? <laughs> with your budget? Uh, basically, the uh, non-feedbox has gone up significantly. Okay. Uh, right, so non-feed costs have gone up quite a lot. Yep, and at the back, what else have you noticed when you did your feed budget, uh, your, your budgets for next year? Right, excellent. Okay, yep. So everyone was starting to see we had a lot of costs going up in some areas of our business and, and depending on the, your type of business, you're exposed to different costs within it. So what we sought to understand was what was driving these costs and therefore how do we start to manage some of those risks and how do we look for the opportunity in this changing economic environment that we're in. So it gives me great pleasure. Um, I'm not an expert on this. This is why we always ask the experts. Um, so we're really lucky today to have um, Nathan Penny with us. So Nathan Penny is He's um, a senior agri-economist with Westpac, and he's got expertise in, in dairy and commodity markets, so he probably interchanges between dairy and sheep all the time as he talks, um, trade economics and economic forecasting. So that's that view about the future and where things are heading. Um, he's also a leading global trade um, auction and New Zealand dairy derivatives commentator. And today he's really going to demonstrate, even though there's lots of graphs with lots of figures on it, what he's going to do is be able to distill that into some key concepts that we can understand and apply to our farm business. Now, what you'll find is that in your handout, if you go to page, um, somebody yell it out because I haven't got it in front of me, 24, 34, you'll see the graphs that Nathan will um, be talking to. And Nathan assures me that you can throw questions at him as he goes and he won't be distracted by them um, and we'll still be able to keep him on, on track, okay? So we're going to keep it as a pretty open, um, informal session to make sure that you really do understand some of the key messaging that's coming out of it. So um, big warm welcome and thank you to Nathan for coming here today and I'm going to hand it over to you to give us an overview about what does this economic environment look like for dairy farmers moving forward. Can you, can you hear me? No, you need to jump up because we're recording up. Oh, Come on, up you go. So I'm scared I'm going to fall off. No, you'll, you'll be right up. <laughs>
Um, all right, cool. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me. And it's um, yeah, great to be here. Uh, I have the pleasure of coming down from Auckland. Um, and um, it's actually good to see some real people because our Westpac office is essentially empty. Um, so we go in and, yeah, it's a bit lonely. So it's nice to have some real people. Um, is anyone watching Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> it's pretty, pretty cringe cringe-worthy TV, isn't it? Uh, I'm not a fan, to be honest. Um, so apologies to those who are fans. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't watch it. Um, you know, if it was the last thing I had to watch uh, on, on Earth, I wouldn't watch that. Um, but on the dance theme, um, I am prepared to um, participate in a rain dance today if, if that's what we need, by the sounds of it. And looking around, um, that green is an illusion. So Happy, happy, um, if I, you know, I'm very happy to bring my two left feet to the rain dance that maybe we can organise a bit later on. Um, so, yeah, this is your session. Um, basically, I've got a whole lot of slides, but I'm going to probably avoid talking to them directly. Um, what I want to talk about is a little bit high, high, um, bigger picture. Um, you know, we really have, things have really changed really quickly over the last couple of years through COVID and the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll touch on those C's that, that Joe mentioned that we're basically, um, I'll put this up, but is it up there? The C's, the C's were um, COVID, conflict, and was it on carbon? Capital carbon. Oh, capital and carbon. So the, the four C's, I'll talk about that. Um, but let's start with COVID. Uh, COVID for, for New, Zealand, New Zealand Inc. Um, and New Zealand farm, farmers and growers, on balance, if you think about it, it's actually been a, a net positive for us. Um, strangely, strange as that may seem, um, but it has actually been a net positive for us. Why? Well, we've been we've been isolated in our little part of the world, and we've and particularly in you know in, in, in the regions like like here, we've been able to get on with business, right? We'll get on with farming and growing, and by and large, COVID hasn't touched us too much. Um, you've probably had a few people sick in the last. In the last month or two, um, is it, I mean, have people had had um, workers away? The odd person here and there. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're close to to the sheep and beef industry, obviously the meat works have been disrupted um, over the last month or two, or you know, and are still disrupted now. And then if you go right back to the start of COVID, um, there were the disruptions um, in March, March, April, uh, 2020. But really. We've been able to get on and do what we do best, right, and that's farm um, as, as we normally have. And, and um, I was actually quite jealous over the last couple of years being stuck at home in Auckland, uh, you know, in lockdown, and you guys have had the run of the house on your farms, um, you know, doing your day-to-day -day and then also uh, going for the, you know, strolling around your farm, whereas I've, I've had to basically stroll to the supermarket with, with three masks on, um, and that's been the, my lot. So, so... All up, if you, if, you, if you try and gather it all in, COVID's been good for us. Because the other side of the equation is what's been happening to our competitors, right? Our competitors haven't had the same luck. COVID's been bloody hard for them. And we've seen that in particular in things like what really important for global, global agri-markets, we've seen that in uh, things like grain markets. Grain markets, um, you know, as absenteeism, supply chain issues... Those, those prices have really gone through the roof. And that's what um, really matters for our competitors in, in, the, in the Northern Hemisphere. So grain feed costs are through the roof, um, and they've really had to battle the last couple of years. It's been a battle for us, but for different reasons, right? Um, but the, we've, we've been able to work with a margin <coughs> over the last couple of years, whereas our competitors offshore haven't had a margin because their costs, particularly around their grain feed costs, and others, of course, have really worked against them. So that's kind of been um, the, the, the first thing on COVID is actually it has worked out on balance a positive for us. Um, and you can, see, you can see here, if you like, you can see the, the, um, the, lift, in, um, the lift in prices, um, <clears throat> dairy prices, through the, through the pandemic years. And, and the thing that's different about this 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 price cycle, if you like, is that that 
That was a rather graceful fall, wasn't it? Um, the thing about this, this commodity price cycle, when we compare it back to the one, you know, the one we all remember, um, where was it? Yeah, 2014, is that this cycle is different in that it's going to be much longer and prices are going to stay higher for longer. Um, so if you think about in milk price terms, you know, 950 call it this year, um, and we're thinking another $9 milk price uh, next year as well. And if we remember back to um, 2014, 840, and then, heaven forbid, what was it, 430 the following season, and then 390, the one after that. So it's going to be quite different this time. And, and, and the key reason is that there really isn't milk around to fill, fill the gap that we've seen from COVID, during COVID. Um, you look at New Zealand, obviously we've had bad weather and other things conspiring against us. But in Europe, in the US, um, production is under the pump there. And mainly it's, it's around um, the ability to, to produce. There's constraints, number of people, labour issues, those sorts of things but also their margins are, are not, not, not anywhere where they need to be for them to crank the handle on production. And so there isn't a big, there isn't a big supply response coming um, this year like, like there was back in 20, 2015. So this is going to be a longer cycle um, and, <clears throat> and therefore we're expecting um, consecutive high milk prices. And then when we get back to it, we were talking about before, the back to it, where is the new normal? The new normal is actually now $8, give or take, right? There's still, still a, a wide range around that, but eight is the new six. And that, and that has really, COVID has really accelerated that move. We all knew it was happening anyway, right? Your costs were, were lifting, whether it was regulation, compliance, and a whole lot of other things, your costs were lifting. Um, availability of labour or, or competition for land from other, other, other sectors. We all knew that was happening, but it was happening quite slow. What COVID has done is sped up that process, and now we're at a new long-run milk price of, of $8. And when I say long-run, I mean the next 10 years. So COVID has changed a lot. It really has changed a lot. But in a, in a way, it's sped up the process, and actually we're in a better position uh, than we were pre-COVID, because we've, we're actually, um, we've got a margin to work with, um, but our offshore competitors at the moment at least don't have that luxury. Um, overnight, well, two nights ago, we had the big drop in dairy auction, interesting, interesting little story, I mean, I'll um, talk to you about that, you know, big, some big numbers there, some, um, what, what's been going on, or what's been going on recently versus, versus you know, the last six months, say, if you go back six months ago, Everything, everything was lining up the right way for commodity prices to hit, you know, hit these peaks up. Everything was lining up the right way. So everything that could go wrong with, with global dairy production did go wrong, right? So we had a drought in the US. We had, um, of course, we had the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. So we had fertilizer prices going through the roof, fuel prices going through the roof. Um, we had, again, we had supply chain issues, we had absenteeism in, um, in farms and through the supply chains. So everything that could go wrong, uh, we had bad weather here in New Zealand as well, um, everything that could go wrong did go wrong for supply. And on the, on the flip side, in particular in China and Southeast Asia, demand was, was really good, right? So everything lined up and boom, prices went to their highest, highest in a very long time. In some cases, particularly for um, things like butter and cheddar, they were the highest on record. That never lasts, right? That never lasts. You can't get everything line up all in one way and expect it to last. And, and what we've seen over the last um, couple of months is that a few things have started to go the other way, as we expected they would. Um, wasn't necessarily the things we thought that would improve. Well, I thought the weather would be, I thought we'd have some rain by now and the weather would, start, would have started to turn around. We haven't had that. Instead, we've had um, uh, uh, an Omicron outbreak in China. Um, and that's, that's hit demand. We've also had a, uh, obviously we've had the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict. We've also had a, a conflict in, in Sri Lanka, one of, one of, um, one of our, our strong and, and um, quite quite um, 
profitable markets for us. We've had a conflict there, and that's, that's put a spanner, spanner in the work. We're probably not a story we've heard too much about, but nonetheless, a good New Zealand mar market that we've, we've, we've had for a very long time is now being upset by conflict. So finally, we've getting a few things go the other way, and we have had prices fall. Now the question is, what's permanent, what's permanent, and what's not, right? So Omicron's, Omicron waves usually pass. So at this stage, we think that the Chinese Omicron wave will pass, and Chinese demand will recover to somewhere like it was pre, pre this wave. Um, <clears throat> and that's important um, to note. The other thing is the supply issues, production around the world is still really tight. There's still no production growth to speak of anywhere. So that's a more a medium term thing that will stick around for a while. So that will underpin prices going forward. So we're going to have a weak spot. We've got a few things going the wrong way. But, but we think that come, come the spring, we think that underlying prices will, um, will rebound as China comes out of its Omicron wave, and the, the key thing around production tightness globally will reassert itself as the dominant, dominant force for prices. Um, what have we got? Oh, sorry. For the beef, uh, I, won't, I won't really talk to that unless anyone's got any questions. I've got 20 minutes, um, so that's my COVID, COVID little COVID, COVID section. What? Um, yeah, got some questions so far. I've covered COVID and I've covered conflict a little bit before I get on to capital and, and what was the other one? Carbon. Well, carbon's more Dave, but um, any questions there? What do you think? Am I crazy? I've been, I've been told I'm crazy quite often by farmers. I'm going to show you some, um, some slides after this a bit later on that will confirm either way whether I'm crazy or not. So um, am I crazy? Supply side, um, what about the demand side and specifically in terms of a response to high inflation around the world? Yeah, good, good, good question. I mean, it's, um, um, yeah, we, 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 we're in the space of rising interest rates for the first time in a very long time, you know, um, and, that, and that's, you know, all quite different for everybody, right? Um, so is that going to impact global growth? Yes. The answer is, short answer is yes, and that's, that's important, but it's um, not as important as, as the supply situation. And the key thing there is, I mean, we generally dairy is more in the staple basket than in the luxury basket, right? Obviously, we do have some products which are luxury items, you know, and you, what are we thinking there? Um, um, Duck Island ice cream or whatever. Um, um, I'm from Capri. I should have said Capri ice cream. Sorry. Um, we are in we we are in in <coughs> in the in the basket. Of, there are some luxury items or, or premium products in our basket, but generally dairy is in the in the staple staple part of the um, sort of the consumers you know budgets and, and their and their, their food consumption. So therefore, when, even when demand global demand crunches down and incomes are a bit tighter, we don't expect too much of a response from from um, consumers. They still consume their dairy in general. So therefore, yeah, yes, it matters, but not nearly as much as, the, as the, um, the supply crunch. That's the key driver over the next 12, 18 months. Any thoughts on input prices? Input prices. Good question. Good question. So that's, um, I've kind of been quite, quite rosy. COVID's been good for New Zealand. Um, here comes the, the kicker. Um, and I might as well transition to that. Um, inflation, you've all mentioned, what, what was your 50 to 60 cents? Um, what was our farm? Um, you said you put your budget up from 60 cents as well, wasn't it? $4 to 4.60 and you're struggling. Um, so the short answer is that inflation cost increases for our sector is going to get is going to continue to be um, a problem going forward, and much more so than the rest of the economy. Okay, so this is this is not a challenge that's going away anytime soon. Um, <clears throat> why? Why? Um, so the Reserve Bank is lifting interest rates, as as you pointed out, as are other um, central banks around the world, and that's to essentially to slow down the economy, right? To slow down the economy, 
to take the heat out of the economy, um, you know, sort of suppress demand a little bit, and that will help ease prices. It, it, you know, less demand mean, should mean that prices slow down. What's different in our sector? I'm saying we're going to have another $9 milk price, right? So our sector is different. We're not like household sectors who are feeling the pinch. Um, we, our incomes are still very strong. So therefore, when, when farmers go to purchase feed and, and, and other inputs over the next 12 months, they've, got, they've still got buying power. They've still got purchasing power, which other parts of the economy won't necessarily have. So not a pretty story. Got to say it, though. I expect um, the pressure on costs for farmers to continue to be really rough over the next uh, season at least. Um, and a lot of that is because farmers have got the ability to, to pay up. Um, now, maybe a bit of, bit of uh, musical cheers. So the last little while, fertiliser's been, you know, and obviously a few across the board, but there's been a few things that have gone faster than others. I think there may be a bit of a switch where some of those things maybe level off or come off a bit, but other things are going to go up. Um, one of those, I think, might be wages. If you haven't already seen it, I think you, you, you should brace yourself for some more issues around wage, wage presses, um, but also feed. I think that's obviously another one. You know, obviously, it's weather dependent, but, but I think there will be a little bit of that, a little bit of that. You know, things have gone really big on um, certain inputs, and you know, others have gone as well. There may be a little bit of musical chairs over the next 12 months. But in, in general, it is still going to be a rough picture for um, farmers over the next 12 months, if not a little bit longer. And that's due to the fact that farmers have got uh, strong incomes, whereas in the rest of the economy, um, you know, that's not the case necessarily. Probably in construction, it's the same. You know, we all know about how, how, how um, hot construction is, so construction and agri are, are quite similar. Um, but the rest of the economy hasn't got that buying power, um, even as, as costs rise. Yeah, mate? So, so I'm I'm part of the economics team, yep. um, and um, so I my job is to to inform form my best view, um, and so um, I think I've already mentioned my as of um, yesterday, my forecasts are 950 and 925 for next season. Um, Westpac, in terms of the banking banking side of things, and I've got Dave and Joe here who can elaborate um, as necessary, but we 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 take a different approach. Um, yeah, we um, we do have a what do we call it? It's not status quo. Is that what we call it? We have a status quo milk price, and we've updated that recently. And what's the 750 is our status quo, and that's sort of our you know can you run your business at that that level? That's and we test test how um, you know we kind of stress test that as we think about your lend, uh, you know your proposals to, to borrow. Um, so we have that as a as a as a benchmark we use. Um, for the current season, we, we end up, we usually use the Fonterra um, payout as our base for the current season, thinking about budgets and things. Um, so yeah, I, I am a little bit different in the sense that I sit outside and I, I also inform what, what the, um, yeah, what the, what, where the milk price is likely to go, whereas the banking side think about, okay, we need to be a little bit more careful around how we do budgets and how we, you know, can you, can you get through a tough time and what that tough time might look like. Ooh, ooh! Well, I think we are. Um, so, so Westpac, Westpac is different to to others. Um, and and I mean, Dave, do you want to do you want to answer some, that question? I, I mean, just just quickly from, I suppose I'm an older farmer now, but yeah. But um, the the way I've seen farming change. Um, when I first started farming, I had to get dressed up in my good clothes and go to the bank manager and uh, ask if he would give me the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, before long, the bank manager got dressed up in his good clothes and came out and saw me and asked me if I'd like to buy the neighbour's farm. Um, yep. Now everyone's in their good clothes and nobody's talking. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's a, um, I like that. Can I, can I use that? Um, um, <laughs> um, 
No, I mean, it's, it's true. There has been a shift over the last six years across the industry. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and the general shift is that, you know, debt has been high in the sector. And there is a, a, a definite um, shift away from, um, you know, lending against future capital rises, um, you know, land value rises, to a shift to lending against cash flow. Um, that's a very, very quick explanation of where the shift and how the shift has worked. And obviously, um, uh, in a way, we think that's been, been a good move for the industry in general because debt was getting too high in the sector. Um, so now it is very much a question of if you can, if you can um, you know, generate, if your, your farm business generates enough cash to, to, um, you know, to, to make a, loan, a, a lending decision stand up, then we're open for business, definitely. And you know, Dave and Joe will, will tell you, you know, if, if you're looking at doing something, um, you know, come and talk to them. They're, we're definitely open for business. But there has been a shift in terms of you know, the sustainability of, of debt levels and what that means in terms of you know, the ability to service that debt. And we, we think, of, th think about that in terms of cash flow now rather than what, what land, vo land values might do in the future. Um, have I covered that? Capital. capital? Yeah, so there has been, so um, Dave will correct me if I get this wrong. Um, there has been um, some moves by the Reserve Bank, basically, um, over the last few years, which essentially is saying to banks that you have to hold more capital against your agri agricultural loans. So to do that, we've obviously had to um, offset, offset that by being more careful around, um, around who we lend to. So the, the riskier the, the loan, the more capital we have to hold. So that, that's been a process that's been happening in the last few years and is, is continuing because those capital requirements are actually going to increase. They're going to be increasing over the next... Do a slide on it. Um, um, is, is it in my, my part? Yep. So this is the one, this one interesting is, interestingly is, is farmers deleveraging. So you can see there um, the, it sort of looks to you, does that look black to you, that line? Um, that's the dairy, dairy, um, dairy loans to, to all dairy, dairy farmers across the country. And you can see over the last couple of years, farmers have been deleveraging. Um, whereas the rest of debt in, in the sector has been uh, quite, well, it's been growing gradually. Most of that has been into horticulture. Uh, sheep and beef has been quite flat. Um, so that's been a, um, been a function of, you know, partly driven by banks, but partly driven by farmers as well around the idea that, you know, um, farming for cash is, is sort of more sustainable, um, you know, whereas um, farming for capital gain isn't necessarily um, as sustainable and you need to be quite careful of that, given you know the maturity in the in the dairy farm market. Um, and was there another one, Dave? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this is this is what the Reserve Bank has kindly uh, made us do. So uh, currently, we're we're expected to hold 10.5% um, against our agri. Um, so this is team of Dave. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's across all loans, um, so housing, business, and other loans as well. And then over the next, what's that, six years, we need to increase that by 18, uh, to 18%. So essentially... You already have that after COVID. Eh? You already have that after COVID. Everyone's put their money in the bank. Yeah, so this is the, share, this is the share, shareholder capital, so the, the, the owners of Westpac and other banks. This is the amount of capital they have to keep in the business. Um, so yeah, so a 7.5% increase over time. So that's part of the reason why um, you know, far, uh, banks are necessarily being uh, more selective in who they lend to. But, say it again, we're open for business. If you're keen and you, you're, you, can, you can show us that your, your, your farm is going to be profitable over the next few years and sustainable, come and talk to these guys. So Nathan, <clears throat> just a couple of minutes. I see you you swept past the slide that had the carbon on it. Did you want to touch on that one at all, or? Oh, can I can I skip can I skip it? Oh can yeah. I, can I ask this one? I finish with this one. All right, um, okay. I've talked about, um, and we can come back to it later if you like, or you can hit me up afterwards. Um, ask a question. Are you guys price takers? 
Is that a resounding yes? Does anyone think that you're not a price taker? So this is the part where I, where I ask you, am I crazy? And you keep, you keep nodding. Most of you normally keep nodding. Um, so I think, and I, I use this, this is um, an example from, um, I use lamb, lamb markets. This is quite a good example. Um, so if you go back nearly 20 years ago, here's, here's the sort of balance of power between a New Zealand uh, lamb exporter and a British supermarket. And when, when lamb exporters, you know, the likes of um, AFCOs and Alliance and Silver Fern, um, and the, what's the guy, um, Greenlee, the locals here, um, I was talking to Tony Egan about this. He'd go, he'd go to, um, what's one of the, Tesco's? He'd go to Tesco's and say, hey, I'd like to put my, you know, I'd like, I've done some cool things with my lamb, can you pay me 10 cents more? And they'd go, nah. They'd basically tell him to, to bugger off. And by the way, um, AFCO's coming tomorrow, so um, think about that. This is the conversation he'd have in 2005. Um, and if you've, ever been, if you've ever been to a British supermarket, I don't know who's done that, OE, but you used to go into supermarkets and you, you'd buy a leg of lamb, right? Or you'd, you'd search out the leg of lamb in the supermarket. And you'd go, oh, yeah, found some kiwi lamb. And then you'd go, damn, that's cheap. And actually, the, the UK supermarkets would use the lamb as loss leaders. So they basically sell it at a, at a loss. How would they make it up? They'd have a stack of red wine from France next to it, which they'd charge 100% you know, um, margin on. So they'd make their money on the French, French wine, and they'd be happy to lose a pound or two on the kiwi lamb. So that was, the, that was the conversation they were having with New Zealand export, uh, lamb, lamb exporters. They were basically wanting to screw them as hard as they could so they could make as much money as possible on the French wine. Not good for you guys as farmers. You know, and a similar kind of dynamic was, was in dairy. Fast forward. Call it today. Now, your average New Zealand lamb exporter, when he goes to see Tesco's now... Tesco's are rolling out the carpet for them. Why is that? Basically because Tesco's now has to fight to procure lamb from New Zealand. Why? Short answer, China and the USA are buying a lot more lamb. And they are taking a crap load of it. The UK supermarket is just a medium-sized buyer now. So they have to, when they talk to Greenlee or, or Alliance or Silicon Farms, they have to front up and go, you know that 10 cents you asked me for back in 2005? I will pay that now. Because they have to pay it, otherwise they don't get the lamb. Now this is a, this is a situation where we're in across most of our food markets now, and the big change is a level shift in demand. You know, dairy production globally on the main exporters averages about 1% per year. So that's us, US, and Europe. We average about 1% growth in production per year. Dairy demand is growing at 2 or more percent. So what's happening in our... What's the proof of this sort of concept? What's happening here in New Zealand? Anyone live near Pocono? You drive, everyone drives past it, yeah? What's in Pocono that you see? You can see quite easily from the motorway. Two, two big, almost brand new dairy, dairy, um, dairy factories, right? Where, where are they? Who owns them? Chinese. Anyone from, anyone head down to Tokara? Do you know what's happening down there? Or is, is it, has it started? I'm not sure. It started, yeah. Olam, Singaporean company, are building a brand new factory. What are they, do, what are they here to do? Buy New Zealand milk. What are they not going to do? <laughs> they're, not, they're not here to come second, basically. What does that mean? They're going to pay up. They're going to pay up. They're going to pay you guys a good price. If you, you know, they're going to they're going to pay up. They're going to they're going to match Fonterra, or they're going to do ten cents better, or whatever they need to do. They're not here to come second. They're not building a dairy factory in Tokara to come second. Olam's a big, really big food company, really good company. They know what they're doing. They're here for a reason because they need to secure milk. And so this balance of power that we used to think, you know, back 20, 30 years ago when we were price takers, we definitely were, and I am thinking collectively here, we definitely were price takers in the past, we're not anymore. 
it's a much more balanced, balanced situation where we... Yeah, go ahead, mate. Good question, yeah. So, so a function of this is when your costs go up, you have more power, you, what we call in economics terms pricing power, you can pass on those costs to a larger degree than you used to be able to. So this is, a, yeah, and I can see you folding your arms and this is why you think I'm crazy, right? I'll give you a really good story. So Sinlay, and I, I realise there's some um, Fonterra people here, but this is a really cool story. I'm, I'm going to... Steve on some toes and telling it. Danone now buys its milk from, from Sinlay. Danone send a, a representative out to talk to their farmers every year. This dude came out to talk at their, their annual, annual farmers suppliers um, conference and he got up on one of these sort of platforms, I'm assuming, and he said, hello, I'm Jean-Pierre from Danone from France. I'm here to talk to you. I hear you have the problem with compliance and the, the, the regulations. I understand. I hear you. Please just do it. I will pay. Sat down. That was all he said. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's all he said. <laughs> and, and, yeah, so... That's, that's an example, and I think the Olam factory is another example. Is they will pay. They will pay. This conversation is a much more balanced conversation. They will help you pay for those costs. And I guess my, mar my last question is around, um, my last comment is, um, we, had, we had four Cs. I want to add one more, confidence to invest in this stuff. So I hear you in terms of compliance, regulation. It's costing you dollars, right, to invest in that stuff. My point is... You can have confidence to invest in that because you will get paid for it. This is kind of my final, final point. Are you not going to show the shoes on the other foot for your last slide? Oh, then, sorry. <coughs> this is the two left feet. So this is. Um, <laughs> yeah, the shoe has moved. So essentially, <laughs> essentially that that difference now. This is what it used to look like. This is now what it looks like. So essentially, the shoe is on the other foot. We have farmers in New Zealand have got. More, more um, pricing power. So the old shoe, we can give, we can give food buyers a bit of a kickback when they ask for something, whereas before they, they, they were the ones doing all the kicking. So the shoe is on the other foot. Awesome. I, I just have to tell you one quick story because you uh, just mentioned that one. Yeah. I used to supply open country for 13 years ago, and uh, we went to a meeting and we asked them, do we need to fence our waterways off? And the head of open country said. Our job is to process milk. Mm. Pick your milk up and process and abide by the regional council rules. That's all we do. Yeah, and it's interesting, OLAM used to own open country milk. And now OLAM have sold their shares of open country milk and built their own factory. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So thank you, Nathan. You've um, managed to uh, describe, I guess, in a, in a very broad way all these impacts that are happening to what we see economically within our farm business. I, what I thought I would do is just take the time for you to uh, maybe have a bit of a stretch of your legs and, and talk to the person next to you and think a little bit about what surprised you most about Nathan's presentation. What was in there that you, you were a little bit unsure about, but, uh, but um, something sort of was highlighted to you as a bit of a surprise, and maybe one thing that you're doing in your business to either max, uh, to either manage that risk that you see, or to maximise the opportunity that Nathan has talked about. So um, take take three or four minutes uh, amongst the people around you, have a quick chat about that, reflect and digest that before we move into our next session, focusing on uh, budgets and how we look at that for our farm. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, so it sounds like there's been some good discussion. Does anyone want to share what was the, one of the gems? What was something that surprised you when, you when you just had that discussion then? What was one of the things that came out? Any surprises there? That surprised you, Matt, how high they were? Yes. Yeah. How do you feel about that? <laughs> Confidence. Yeah. Great. Okay, excellent. You might get Holter. <laughs> yeah, lock it in for three years. That's what we did. <laughs> I was surprised by the uh, Congress' um, unwillingness to forecast accurately the 
Over 10 plus. So you're wondering why is it still conservative, Richard? Yeah. 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 Right. So that's that relatively of the short term forecast. Yep. So I guess probably what you're starting to highlight is how important that relationship is working with your agri professionals. Um, that, you know, like with Joe sitting down and understanding long term versus this year versus, because we're making decisions that we're planning out sort of 10 years' time, plus we've got short three year time horizons, plus we've got next year. Having the data that allows you to make informed decisions for the, as your system evolves, is really, really important. Um, anybody else just want to add a comment after Richard before we move on to what that means for our farm? Cool, okay, so there's a lot of detail here and I'm not going to go through it all um, with you, but I just wanted to highlight, this is in page um, 41 of your handout. What we've put there is we've put our detailed farm budget for next season and I just wanted to talk about a couple of things here. For our farm, this year in particular is quite a big transition year for us. We've um, we've had some land sale that has gone into um, development right on the edge of Cambridge, you'll know where our farm boundary is. Uh, this year is what we call a transition year, we were going to be moving down from sort of that 380 cows down to about 350 to set us up for the start of next season. So when we look at the budget, make sure you, you take it in the context that we are going through a transition year, so where you see expenses going down on a, a, a whole number, it's because we have got a, we've got an associated drop in milk production, we've got a drop associated drop in um, input. So just a couple of things I wanted to highlight on the um, the budget though. We used an $8.50 payout for our budget and we've put that into the Fonterra milk price calculator using sort of 12 fifteenths of that payout, pro rated out, which gives us about a, um, I think it's a seven, um, 770 uh, advance rate on there, I think, or is it 680? Oh, I can't remember now. Uh, da, 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 in there. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, 770. Um, one of the, th the big thing to watch is when you go into that milk, milk payment um, calculator, just to make sure at the moment it's defaulted through to this year's payout. So when you do go through, make sure that you're putting in what you think the advance rates are going to be. We're working it with, uh, it's a 190 uh, deferred, and then we've just put through what we think it's going to be going through for the, the, the season coming. Um, what's that? Oh, I opened with whatever it opened with last year. I think it was four. 460, 450, I think it's 460. So I, up till December, I kept it pretty much the same, and then from December onwards, I prorated out, I think it was on a 30 or 40 cent each time to get to, to our, our point. So, um, so for us, there's room in that payout, and um, the room in the payout comes when we get to normally about December, between December and February, when we've seen what the summer will deliver, and we can make a choice on whether we choose to buy more feed to make the most of either the weather is giving us. So we set our system up to deliver pretty much a production system till normally about mid-February where we can choose to cull um, empty cows um, and that allows us to feed our crops. We have enough feed in the system to be able to achieve to that point. Any extra increase in the payout gets firmer by then and then we've got the ability to choose to buy in more supplements to make the rest of the last part of the season. So that's kind of generically how we use our, our budgeting process and the key points in it. What you'll notice um, which is quite interesting in our farm budget, um, there's some unders and overs and I'll talk to that a little bit more, but the wages, the rubber bank um, remuneration survey showed a 15% increase in salary over the last two years and we've made a committed effort over the next two years to do a good to great workplace project and that really is in response to some of the challenging conditions we're finding to retain, uh, recruit, retain and create valued workplaces in the deer industry because we're going to continue to need great great people in our industry and part of that is getting more flexible and lower work hours for our for our wider team. So there's quite a big investment for us over the next couple of years on what that looks like and it means that for this coming year we're going to still have 2.8 FTs on the farm even though the farm will eventually be moved to a 2.2 with the use of the technology that we've got. Um, we're transitioning a new manager and we've also got one of our team members has gone back home for, for two months at the moment to catch up with family and loved ones, which they haven't been able to do for a long time. 
So that's one, one point to note. Um, animal health pretty much has, has stayed the same. Um, there's some small cost increases in there. Um, and breeding and herd improvement has, has pretty much stayed the same, pro rata out. Um, we may look to use, um, and it'll be interesting when we talk to you out in the paddock about doing a second round of heifer synchrony, just to see whether we can actually mop up some more sick semen um, if we were to do that and the associated cost with that. Um, there's some areas, there's some small increases around, you know, the farm dairy electricity and stuff like that, but probably the biggest ones we're finding are in our, our PK um, and probably our fertiliser costs. We've guaranteed, like I said, the production system early on in the year, and we've guaranteed the nutrient status. So what do we need to deliver our outcomes from a feed production um, point of view? So even though you can see that the fertiliser cost is going down, part of that is food that we purchased this season when we got it really cheap. We've been able to carry through. So there's about, um, I think I've got eight and a half tonne of sustain that we were going to use this autumn. The rain never came, so we never did. That's still sitting in the shed there, and we'll be able to use that this spring. So that comes off next year's budget. Um, we, these are the prices as of March. So we've put them into the budget. It's very likely that these will go up. So um, making sure to monitor and understand how those costs are moving in your system will allow us to think about how and when we buy our products. We don't have a lot of storage on farm, so we have to be very mindful about what we cho choose to store and how we can keep the quality of it as well. Um, the other cost areas pretty much are, are, are fairly standard. We're looking at getting more efficiencies with um, less vehicles needed. So when our lease on our second tractor runs off, we won't be replacing it. Um, as the motorbikes um, turn up... <coughs> <coughs> run through, we'll be dropping a motorbike, transitioning to e-bikes. Um, just, we find there's less wear and tear on the machinery because we're not following cows, we're not um, having to do a lot of the shifting and movement that we were doing before we had halter. So that sort of stuff will start to flow through in next year's budget and the year after. There's a couple of big ticket items for us, water charges. We pay 32.7k a year in water. So one of our big projects this year is to look at water usage in the shed, and um, Tom's already started that process around trying to find where the leaks are and water efficiency use, um, and also sprinkler use, because heat stress is a, is a corresponding um, challenge that we're managing. Plus, we're also looking at how we can upgrade stock water. So there's going to be a big focus on both um, water and potentially electricity for us as well. So... Um, that's the, all the details in there, and you're welcome to, to come in and uh, have a chat about some of the, the input parts of it. But when we, I wanted to share with you more generically what does that look like within our farm business. And this is where we've come up with this concept called the staircase um, of income and expenses. And we produced this last year because when we went to the Farm Management Committee with a $5.21 budget, and remember, all our labour costs is in there, so we're not having to pay any drawings or, um, for anybody. It's all included in that. Um, they said, crikey, what's going on? That's not $4.60. Where are your costs coming from? So we were able to pull out where we saw inf inflation or increase in input costs, where we saw our commitment to industry standards, and where we saw future proofing for our farm. And we've come up with a staircase um, approach. This year, when we did the same, everybody said, where's your staircase for income? Because all of a sudden, it wasn't just about payout, it was about how we were extracting value from our farm business. So I'm going to very quickly see if I can explain the staircase on both sides of the ledger and what it looks like. The first part is the staircase of expenses. And um, it's, you know, it is a graphic, so it's, it's, um, it's there to represent or tell a story. Uh, what we're finding, like for our business, the, what we call the rise in input costs is roughly about 35 cents for us this year. And the bulk of that um, rise in input costs... Right up here. Um, ..is we've got about 13k in extra fert costs, so same product, extra expense, and about 26k in, in PK. There's small amounts of increase in our silage and things like that, but those are some of the, the really big ones that we're getting. We've also got wage rate increases, um, and there's a bit in fuel um, um, and grazing. Like, grazing went up a dollar a head per week plus sink. So all those little bits and pieces all get added into our rising input costs. 
We've got some increasing standards. So the wagon wheel is effectively what Nathan was talking about, is how do we um, create a product that we know is going to meet the standards, so when they come and say, do what you need to to achieve the results, this is what it's actually costing us, and this is where we can work with our providers to say this is the kind of return or the reward we need for the fact that we're actually producing a product that our consumer wants. These are the areas that have been um, the messaging we're getting from things like the cooperative difference, the messaging we're getting from our wider community that drive past and interact with our farm, and the message we're getting for those people that are involved within our farm business. So within this, we've got about 47k worth of increasing standards. So that's things like the quality workplace, that's things like um, reducing the, bo um, the bobby calves, um, that's using premium food products to make sure that we are minimising our environmental footprint. Um, it's all those sorts of things. It's all the things that allow us to achieve our wagon wheel. And then we've got the future proofing. So the future proofing costs include, for us at the moment, things like the wearables. So how do we use this technology? How do we gain value from it? How do we make sure that our farm has an auditable um, management system for animal wellbeing? Um, we've also got diverse pastures, so things like plantain, um, making sure that they're successful within the Waikato, and also planting for shade, shelter, and potentially offsetting. So all of those things are things that we're not getting any money for now, but they're things that we believe will take our system forward into the future. Now, the same thing happens on the other side. So we're actually getting huge inflationary pressure on the other side, but we're also getting rewards. So if we start to break down the income... We've got a $2 lift, which is what we call, which is what we've kind of labelled rising um, output value or rising product value, which is what Nathan talked about. We've gone from a use at six fifty to a we six to eight dollars or six fifty to eight dollar. We've got we've got a $2 significant increase in our status quo income side of it. <clears throat> Along with that, we've got the cooperative difference, which you know for us is around about sort of sixteen thousand dollars. If we're providing a product which is of value to our consumer, that that the mark, that can be captured within the markets. For us, our herd is top six percent BW. Um, we are pretty much you know fifty five BW above the average. We get extra value, sixty six dollars a calf when we sell them, changing from a wagyu. Uh, from a bobby to a wagyu, an extra $160 there. Um, all those sorts of things are adding value to the product that we are putting onto the market and we're capturing value from that. So, you know, for us, there's, there's, pro there's you know, 14K in extra stock value there and increasing standards. Um, this year in particular, from a future point, proofing point of view, um, we we're a little bit diverse. We lease some of our land, land to a higher value um, enterprise, so horticulture, and we lease land back. So for us, that's a bit of diversity, and it's also um, when payout's low, it's, it's a really good income earner. When payout's high, uh, it's probably a bit, you know, uh, st status quo. Um, but for us, we're also selling some capital stock. So that gets put into this year's budget because that's money that we're releasing this year that we can use to future-proof or um, ensure you know, the, the integrity of our business as we go forward. So it works on both sides. Um, what also can be included here now is cost of emissions. So for the first time this year, our budget includes $4,900 for our emissions um, this year. So that's at 5% and a $70 tonne uh, price. The reason we've started to put this in is because we're seeing it on the other side of the ledger. So by 2025, we'll be paying for those emissions. And while it looks like a really, really small wedge right now, when you do the sensitivity analysis on the proportion paid and the cost of carbon, it gets really big really, really quick, which is a real worry. So um, I guess the key thing is make sure you understand what your cost is for your business. Remember, we're investing to reduce that number. We're, reducing, we're investing in things to help reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, so that reduces the liability on this side, and we're also investing in how we capture the credits. So those are the two parts that you can start to control within your farm business and start to play with. Um, and the last one that we're also looking at is our cost of borrowing. So for a while, we've been really focused on reducing, just like every other farmer, like you showed us, Nathan, the deleveraging that's happening in the dairy industry. We've been doing that at our farm. We've been paying down, down debt to make sure we secure our business and make sure we're ready for the future that comes ahead of us. But what we've now got is the opportunity to extract value from increasing the, the, the standards that we've had on farm. And part of that is now we can access discounted lending rates 
on our, on, our, on our loans. And I thought now was a really good time just to talk a little bit about SAFI and the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative and what that actually means for us at our farm and what it could potentially mean for the dairy industry. So just before I welcome David up to the um, stage, is there any questions um, about some of the budget stuff that I've presented about our farm there? Or even about this concept, um, about looking at both sides of the ledger. <coughs> to look pretty. <laughs> it's quite a lot to take in, but it's really interesting because I think we, we, we saw these costs changing, but we have to put in the context of what, what's happening in the wider industry, like Nathan talked about. Where's the inflation coming from? And knowing, are we, is, it, is it on track? And I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see that blue line on the left, which is our cost of input costs, is going to get blown out again this year. So this is our best known point where we know we are, we're at, but by the end of the year, that's going to blow out even further. But the more we understand and know it, um, I think the, the more enabled you are to, to make good decisions for your business. Yes, Chris. <laughs> okay, so the question is how much is speculation and how much have you been able to lock in? So really interesting. So industry standards, we have not been able to lock in the value of it relative to the cost of it yet. Okay, so um, some of it comes in pure returns like we do with stock returns, like we do with milk income. Other, other parts of it comes from, um, say, less uh, turnover in our, in our team on farm. It might come from... Um, I'm trying to think what other ways it adds value to our business. Um, yeah, some of it, it's really hard to capture the value. Um, it, it often gets offsetting costs, but it's really hard to see it and find it. But at the moment, Chris, no. We're, we're spending more on increasing standards, and we have been relatively for the last four years than what we've been able to attract. But what we're seeing is a change of the tide. And as Nathan talked about, we've, the shoe's kind of gone on the other foot. We've been investing to create a product that is sustainable for the future. Over the last two to three years, we've really seen some benefit from it. So for us to do the cooperative difference, we haven't had to spend any more money because we've already invested in those things. For us to do SAFI, we've already spent the money on getting to that point as well. So we're actually now about extracting value. Um, and that's the journey that every farmer has to go through, but we're just probably a little bit that far ahead knowing what was coming. Um, there's still speculation though, Chris. Yeah, there is still speculation, yep. Okay, so now's probably a really good time to, to bring David up. So David, um, Senior Manager in the research team, um, he's actually based in Canterbury. Um, so I had to just preempt how dry it was for him as, as, he, as he came up here. Um, but he's actually Westpac's um, expert on what we call the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative. And we thought that, um, it'd be really good just to give an overview about what it, what it is, um, what it means for our farm, and potentially what it may mean for your business. So just before I, I bring David up, has anyone, um, who's heard of, of SAFI, or the Sustainable Agricultural Finance Initiative? Has anyone? Yep, a couple of you have. Okay, awesome. Well, here, um, now we're about to find out a whole lot more, aren't we, yeah, David? Yeah, 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, there you go. Yeah. Thanks Joe. Um, yeah, so sustainability, I think we've touched on it a couple of times today, and in some cases, some people's eyes sort of glaze over and think, oh, crikey, hit, what's this? What does it mean for us? It's another uh, rule or regulation or something we've got to comply with. Um, but look, it is real and it is important to our consumers who are buying our products and there's an increasing focus on it globally. So it's made its way into um, a lot of your um, businesses already and you're feeling that and it feels like pressure, but it isn't probably going to, it isn't going to slow down. And to, um, to Nathan's point earlier, consumers are prepared to pay. So um, whether it's emissions trading or um, waterway protection or um, social aspects of how we run our business, it's important that we um, um, probably take on the challenge rather than shy away from it. Uh, Sustainable Agriculture Finance Initiative is an initiative that all banks have in New Zealand have um, signed up to. It's a set of guidelines which have been prepared which are um, in line with European uh, Green Bond um, requirements. So it enables um, the New Zealand finance industry to um, lend to uh, borrowers who um, meet those standards and then we can issue a green bond on the back of it. 
why do we want to do that? Um, the green bond market is growing massively. So here's just a quick graph of um, the sustainable finance growth over the last, um, uh, what's that, six years. Um, 2021, uh, sorry, 2020, 760 billion. The first six months of 2021 was 824 billion. I think we ended up at about 1.7 trillion of um, sustainable bonds being issued in, in that year. So, uh, and then this year is um, rapidly growing again. It's like a it's like a um, COVID infection curve. It's it's pretty aggressive. So, but it just goes to show the demand and the appetite around the world for investors to put their money into businesses that um, can prove you're operating in a sustainable manner is um, really aggressive. What does that mean for Westpac? It means that we want to have a, a stable capital base, so we go all over the world for a portion of our funding and seek it from a whole range of um, investors. Uh, we want to have part of our capital base um, is uh, sustainable from the sustainable bond market because it's such an aggressively growing market. You don't want to not be in a market that's, that's growing so quickly. What does that mean um, on a price point? Green bonds are about three to four basis points cheaper than a, um, a standard bond, and the expectation is that that price difference is going to grow. As that market expands, as investors get more uh, focused on um, environmental social outcomes, uh, reducing global warming, um, they think that discount's going to grow and probably grow quite aggressively. Um, so, yeah, rapidly growing market. It, it's an alternative pool of capital, and we think that'll grow quite aggressively. Um, it touches us in a number of ways in that we're already operating in an um, increasingly, increasingly sustainably focused um, area. So you've got Cooperative Difference with Fonterra, you've got Lead with Pride with Sinlay, you've got um, NZFAP Plus with your meat industries. Um, we're all having to meet increasing standards and more importantly, we're getting paid for it and, and those payments are gonna keep on growing. Um, we're seeing the carbon market, and um, we touched on that earlier, that the price for carbon in New Zealand has been aggressively growing and, and you'll increasingly see businesses, and you probably have in the last six months, 12 months, um, see, carbon, uh, see businesses say, look, we're um, aiming for net zero emissions and they're doing that by reducing their emissions and then going and purchasing offsets in the market. So they, um, and we're seeing that impact the land market with sheep and beef hill country land that could be converted into trees has been going. Clearly there's been some unintended consequences of that. Um, you look through the east coast from um, Gisborne down to the Wairapa and you know, vast tracts of good quality productive land going into trees which um, uh, for us isn't a positive. Um, it's a negative and an unintended consequence. Um, and at the moment there's a consultation out from the government about changing that. So I think that's a, that's a good thing and we're gonna see um, probably a move towards natives. We're gonna see a move towards um, incorporation of forestry on um, existing farms on unproductive land. And that's been happening for the last, um, since 1990. I think Derek Moot from uh, Lincoln put out an article in Stuff last week about um, New Zealand agriculture has reduced its uh, emissions by 30% through a mix of efficiency reducing stocking rates and marginal land going to trees. And that's, that's only going to continue, especially um, you, know, you um, live and breathe it with your genetics each year, picking more and more efficient animals, um, it's going to continue. So, but the, the carbon market is changing and it's, we're early days into it and, um, and yeah, we've, we've certainly seen the unintended consequences of it, which um, have been quite challenging for a number of communities. A big driver of that is also that New Zealand is the only country uh, currently that is allowing for 100% carbon emission reduction. Uh, or, or, so a company, a German company coming here buys it can actually uh, claim 100% carbon emission reduction on their parent company because they don't actually have to change their net emissions in Germany so they can write it off completely in New Zealand. Whereas if they're doing a forestry in Germany, they can only do a, a maximum of 10 to 12 and I guess that's part of the unintended consequences and, and hopefully we'll see that change. And there's certainly um, a lot of support to see that change, so um, we'll roll that through. Um, the SAFI framework is, has been set up as a base framework, so we don't have the finance industry in New Zealand running off and doing a whole lot of different um, um, 
guidelines. Uh, there is a stack of frameworks around the world. Uh, we want to have one framework in New Zealand, so that's why the banks have collaborated on setting that framework, and then everyone can set up their own products and processes and behind it. Um, you guys live and breathe compliance and how you run your farms every day. Um, I run a mixed cropping farm in um, Mid Canterbury for my sons, and uh, that, that's outside of work. Uh, the compliance involved with that under ECAN is significant and one thing I enjoy about when we um, get our farm environment plan audited every two years is I send it to about 10 people in um, HQ in Auckland and Westpac who just, um, I guess a lot of people don't understand the level of compliance that we have to uh, go to and meet just to, just to run our businesses and, and that's only increasing. You're seeing it every day from... Um, from your suppliers, from the regional councils, from um, MPI, MFE, Osprey, take your pick. There's a, there's a list of um, regulations as long as your arm that you need to comply with. So SAFI, um, Sustainable Finance Agriculture Initiative, is looking to um, collate a lot of those compliance requirements that you're already doing and put it into one form so that you can um, get a financial benefit, basically we'll package it up, say if you're operating at a, at a high level, and it, it will be a high level, um, that's why we've trialled it with our farm, uh, we'll provide you an interest rate discount on that. So it's early days, we're on a trial scenario with it at the moment, um, and we're probably looking to roll it out in the, uh, in the spring, but um, it is coming and it is another example of, yes there's a cost to compliance in your business, but um, we see um, the value in what you're doing, the investors around the world looking to set up sustainable bonds see a, a, a value in investing in businesses that can uh, control and measure and monitor that and so that discount will flow back to you and over time we expect to see that, uh, that discount growing. What are the specific aspects of it? Um, a lot of it you're already covering. Um, a lot of it is, a, a bit of it is coming that you're going to be covering under um, Haywaka Ekanoa um, and, and that's going to um, match up quite well. So a couple of topics here, climate change, mitigation and adaptation. Um, Haywaka Ekanoa is going to capture a lot of that and a lot of people, their eyes sort of go, oh crikey, you know, that's, a, that's another thing on top of the list of... Um, challenges that we've got in our business and uh, it's good to see it coming through on your income and your cost side, Joe, because it is just going to be, yes, it's going to be another cost. I don't think it matters too much which political party is going to be in power. This program is going to come in as far as I can see. So um, what's important to me with it is A, understanding what it's going to cost you, but more importantly, B, understanding what you can do to um, manage, mitigate, adjust, adapt your business to um, influence those costs. And at the moment there's a lot of discussion in the media about whether it's the right, you know, which is the right model, um, but there's very little discussion about what it means on farm for you and tools that you can use to influence those, um, influence those numbers and influence those costs. So hopefully um, programs like this will uh, improve on that. Protection of water, waste prevention, pollution, healthy ecosystems, you're doing all that already and there's an increasing focus on that, so that's nothing new. You're, you're right across that. Labour rights, animal welfare, health and safety. You've been doing that for years. So there's nothing in there that's groundbreaking or, or majorly different, but um, it will be a reasonably high bar and importantly you need to be able to prove what you're doing. So um, any questions on SAFI? I know when the few times I go in the supermarket, it's price and taste. So I think this is driven from companies that are telling us that this is what we have to do. Now, we have no say on it, but, but, but I believe it's a company thing that's created a whole industry on its own, creating everyone jobs, everyone's clipping the ticket, but I don't believe it's coming from the consumer walking up the supermarket buying his wheat bix from, you know, do I look at the wheat bix that I buy if it comes from Australia from a non-tax paying company? Um, no, I buy on taste and, and price. Yep, I'd probably challenge you on that. Um, what's Fonterra's biggest supplier? I think it's Nestle. 
they were the biggest purchaser offshore. Um, Nestle is working to reduce their um, carbon emissions out of the products they purchased by, I think it's 50% by 2030. They won't be doing that just to be a good corporate citizen. They're doing it because their consumers um, who buy off them want to, want to see it happen. So well, what are they going to do now that Indonesia has banned all uh, exports of, of palm oil and um, other forms of refined oil? They're not going to have an option anymore. They're going to have to go back to their previous options, which were then high input and and uh, high cost. Yep. So yep. you're going to that's going to be driving the cost back up, and the consumer is just like recent surveys have said in New Zealand. Now people are, are buying on their wallet, not actually on on environment. Yep. It's look. There's going to be some lumpy stuff on the way through. It's not going to be a smooth transition. Uh, look at the last 12, 12 months here in New Zealand. What have we seen climate impact wise? Drought in Waikato, drought in Southland, half a metre of um, rain in Canterbury in a day and a half. Bull of floods, bull of floods. Um, East Coast gets whacked up last month. These events are getting more frequent. They're getting larger magnitude. Um, we're seeing them every day, every month. We're living and breathing it on our farms. So um, we, we can't shy away from it. We can't argue um, the science is increasingly um, just very clear on what we're doing, and um, you know, I, I don't think it's something where the consumers can opt in or opt out of. Um, the, the global movement is um, moving towards supporting climate change, and this is just one aspect of it. So, um, and to Nathan's point earlier, the consumers are prepared to pay, so uh, that isn't going away. We're seeing you know, the, the new six, now eight, next year, um, you know, nine-ish, so, um, and, and that's for a range of factors, but the, the market is moving on it, and yes, there's costs in there, but uh, incomes are lifting as well. So, so if, if, the, if the market is moving on it, why aren't then the largest countries in the world with the largest global economies, i.e. the US, China and India, they're not doing anything themselves to mitigate these, these, these actions? Take a look at India now. India right now, yes, has got a, a global heat, uh, uh, the biggest heat wave we've seen in decades, Yep. And they're now crying out to the West to say, hey, you've got to give us more coal because we've got to power our air conditioning units and to, to keep everybody cool. Yeah, look, a big picture discussion. Um, you might hear more about carbon adjustment border mechanism coming out of the European Union. That's a mechanism that they're looking to put in place where every product they purchase from an offshore company or overseas country is going to need to meet their emissions standards. So all of a sudden the purchasing power of some countries is being used to um, influence the, the global market. So, yep, take your point, but it's, it is, um, it's, a, it's a big discussion and influencing yeah. different countries differently. So, David, how long before um, uh, other farmers are able to go to their rural lender provider and, and ask about um, moving on this journey? So, um, probably can't comment on other banks. Um, for Westpac, we are just trialling this with three farms at the moment, seeing how it, how it works. Um, we expect to have a rollout of it in um, October, November, December, something like that, prior to Christmas, and, um, and be yeah, working through from there. And so the information about this, the SAFI is actually available on the website? Um, no. The, the oh, Aotearoa, oh, yeah. the, fr the framework. Yeah. Um, so if you're actually interested, if you, if you, go on, if you look up actual sustainable... Agricultural Finance Initiative. Oh, there it is down the bottom. Yeah. It's actually got all the detail around each of the different areas and, w and what it means to um, kind of achieve in that area. And it's a really good one to start to look at your business alignment. So when we looked through it, we sat there and we said, oh, yep, we, we, we're really well aligned. Um, particularly with that top line, um, the minimum requirements is pretty much where the wagon wheel has taken us over the last four years, four to five years. Um, and the minimum social safeguards, they were easy to tick off. The sticky point for us, and this is where we talk about that investment and future proofing, is the climate change mitigation and the climate change adaptation. That's the new part that we will be working hard to, towards over the next two years. So that's about that commitment to reduce our greenhouse gas, and that's about that, that commitment to have mitigation strategies in place for our farm. So at the moment, we're responding to seasonal variation. We will be making a stepwise shift to um, our farm system that has evolved as a response of the, the changing climate that we're seeing. So those are the sorts of things that we see on a more practical level 
is how we're actually mitigating the challenges of climate change as well as trying to reduce our emissions. So that, that, if you, it's a really good place to go and have a look at, at, at it against your business and see if you're, how well you are prepared to be able to access that sort of discounted lending rate and just to make sure that your practices are, are quite well aligned with where the industry is targeting it. Yeah, and what's coming is um, tools in the toolbox that you can use on farm every day to understand what your impacts are and, and how you can um, mitigate them. Well, I guess a lot of that stuff is not new. It's it's the proof point. How what's the expectation from the banks with what you're doing now on proving, say, animal welfare and, and such? Um, you're already doing a lot of it through um, your farmer environment plans. Meets a lot of your proof point requirements. Um, so the, yeah, there will be a, uh, or internally we're going to have a, um, a framework where you'll just need to show how you're, how you're meeting those various parts of the standards. So um, you know, health and safety, you're already doing it. You already have all the documentation. Everything's um, on, on most farms are operating at a high level from that point of view. You're living and breathing it. So um, I don't think it's going to be anything too major for, for most farming businesses. Just on the animal welfare thing. Um, NPI just released a new document open for consultation around new animal welfare codes of practice at the moment. It's oh, the calf one. The, no, and, and even, um, you've even now got to have the, the correct sire for a cow, um, assuming you know, certain factors of that the sire will meet, so yep. that it's, it's not the wrong bull for the type of cow that you've actually got on your farm. You're already doing that, though. You, you know what bulls suit your cows. That's nothing new. Yeah, well, I, I guess Matt's alluding to there's always policy changes coming down at us, and that's why we've got um, bodies like Dairy NZ and the likes that are, are able to have a voice on our behalf for those things that are workable and not. Um, but at this stage, I guess we're dealing with the things that are already well aligned with where this... Um, the, the SAFI framework is offering the opportunity for us to make maximum yep. value from it, so... Okay, so any more questions about that? Sarah, and then at the back, yep. I just have a really quick question around, so a little fun here of farmers who are having to provide information to be validated, all these... Sorry, providing information to be validated for all these different things, like our cooperative difference on yep. Fonterra, um, or whatever, and then obviously SAFI will be another proof point. And I guess, is there... It's the million dollar question, how do we allow information sharing to make our farmers' lives easier in this space? Good uh, question. Yeah. Um, and there seems to have been a lot of different platforms set up to try and um, centralise that and with varying degrees of success. Um, how we're looking to do this internally is not have any extra compliance requirements on you. So um, your Fonterra Farm Environment Plan already meets... Um, 60 or 70 per cent of, of these rules. Um, your Dairy Insights reports will meet another chunk of them. So it's just pulling an existing bit of compliance that you're doing off the shelf and actually getting some value out of it. So you'll get your cooperative difference payment um, and then we'll provide you an interest rate discount for, for uh, everything you're doing already. So I guess it's just maximising the opportunity and maximising the benefit for work that you're already doing. Just wondering if you're willing to share what your discounts might be. Still under, still under progress. Um, look, um, take a stab three years out from um, now. Good question. We've seen the market have environmental compliance loans for a, a set amount of debt for an effluent or you know, something that's going to help the farm. They've been only for a set period of time. They've been pretty heavily discounted, but then as soon as the um, loan term expires, they bounce back up to the, the current rate. Uh, we're looking to have a discount across all of your debt, not just one portion of your debt. So it's all of your debt in your business um, will be discounted. And at the moment, the market um, difference on a green bond is about three or four points. We're going to be um, materially higher than that, and we expect it to grow. So, um, yeah, I won't go into specific details on it, but, but uh, it will certainly cover the cost of... Um, being involved with the scheme because there, there arguably will be some costs um, and it should um, already be paid for with other premiums that you're getting. So this is one of those times you both put your nice suits on and you go to the table to negotiate, don't you? <laughs> yep. 
Cool. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, and like I said, if you, if you are interested in that, there is uh, some really good information, real detailed information about the framework on the website. So go on and, and have a look at that. Um, I guess uh, the, the purpose really about today was to understand that there's been a shift-wise move in the way that we look at the economic environment and how our businesses react with it. And I guess one of the big highlights for me was just to understand the more we know about where our costs are coming from and where we can extract value, the better equipped we are to design our farm systems as they move forward. So just like we do at our farm, I really encourage you to take the time to understand your business, where you can extract value, uh, where you can get discounted prices, um, and how you continue to evolve your business. And there's, there's clearer, stronger frameworks as to what the industry is demanding from us. So... Um, yeah, I encourage you to get involved, talk to your real professionals um, about what that looks like for you and how you can make that happen.